Hi, right, cute everyone. Uh, welcome to the next edition of Disrupted TV. I'm helping my friend and colleague Claire Amos out by conducting this interview with one of my staff members, Danielle Myberg. Uh, Danielle's been at our school for well, right from the beginning. Um, she's had quite a, a number of roles, which have included um, being our ESCT. Um, she's been a learning community leader. Her main roles now at school are as principal nominee and also as an across school lead for the Fidia uh, Te Tangata Kahui Apo, which we're a member of. Uh, kia ora, Danielle, welcome. Um, um, and it's great to see you. Could you kick off by just talking a little bit about who you are and, and what you do? Thanks, Mari. I think that was a pretty good introduction from you. <laughs> Um, yeah, e-learning stuff, lots of edu nerd things. Um, I really like professional reading, more so than any normal person I've ever met or anyone I've ever met. Steve Mouldy always said, you know, we've been in a conversation Danielle, with Danielle because you've got new things on your reading list. Um, so I think that's maybe the other thing worth knowing about me professionally. And personally, um, Maybe worth mentioning that I like surfing, skating, and circus. Excellent. Of course you do, um, and of course you um, were the the founder and and driver between it of EdChat NZ as well, which um, resurfaced just over ten days ago, which was really cool to see. Um, okay, um, school lockdown and closures and and how we're all coping. It that's that's what we want to um, talk about. Um, and you were really heavily involved in our school's um, preparation for this. Uh, you were a member of the pop-up hooies that we ran to try and get ready. And while we were trying to get ready, the ground kept changing under our feet and um, we had to be really agile and uh, such like. Um, and it culminated with our staff only day, which was on the Tuesday just before we moved into level four. Um, and you ran a really important session there about the principles that were going to drive what online off-site learning would look like. And um, I just remember your first slide. It was it was just basically three words. We've got this as you began your presentation to the staff. Can you just talk to us a bit about what you meant by that? So in our preparation for lockdown or various degrees of lockdown, um, we started looking at our existing principles in our school and how we plan learning normally. And actually, of all the stuff we've put together, there's hardly any difference between the regular, how we would plan online, how we would track our students, all of that stuff um, that is business at you, as usual at Hobsonville Point um, translates into the online world. The only thing that's different really is people's personal circumstance, whether they've got their own small children at home or that kind of thing. But in terms of the pedagogy, I feel really confident about where our school is heading. I'm sure there will be things that we need to sort out, nothing's ever perfect, but I feel like the work that we've done over the past however many years of our school has set us up for this situation really well, where we do have infrastructure um, and pedagogy that copes with flexibility and responsiveness. Cool, I remember um, when you were talking to that slide, you made the comment that we've been open for almost seven years and our kids are ready for this and we've been preparing for this. What, what are the key things around the principles that drive learning design in our school? that you think have prepared us the most? And there's probably a few things. Um, one in particular is our focus on developing self-managing skills. Well, the key competencies in the New Zealand curriculum has talked about learning to manage yourself for how many years now? But I feel like in our school, we have a really explicit focus on teaching that. So opportunities where students do have to manage their own time. Um, things like self-reflection and becoming more self-aware so that you are able to manage yourself more. So we've had, since day one, we've tried our best to, in, to help our students develop that as a skill set, which obviously now, we're not even in the same room as these students. 
that's pretty critical to their success is their how well we've been able to help them manage themselves. Cool. And I think that's a massive part of it. The yeah. other thing that I think is really important is for the what for a number of years now we've really focused on trying to um, ingrain universal design for learning in our practice as just the norm. And although that's not at 100% saturation, we are so far down the line with this in terms of how we present the learning that I think we're, we'll be able to support a lot, quite a big diverse group of learners online, um, more so than we would have otherwise been able to. Cool. I remember later in the day after you'd run that session, I um, was talking to you in the corridor and, you know, to, to thank you for running that session. and. You made a comment along the lines of, you know, look, apart from the fact that there's going to be a lot of negative impacts with COVID-19 and the fact that we're going into lockdown, that you personally were, you know, you felt quite excited about potential, about opportunity, and you felt like it was your time. That They, they weren't quite your words, but um, something along those lines. What, what, what were you meaning by that? A um, few things. I think the first one, Claire Amos and I, years and years ago talked about why do kids have to always come to school and be in front of us with those 30 kids and we have to know where they are every second of every day um i don't believe we need that anymore so i felt like this is an opportunity that we can see that there are other ways of working that we can adopt and this kind of forces everyone to just stop take a breath and go actually there's more than one way to skin a cat um, so I think a big part of me was excited that we finally get to trial this like completely off-site learning and students check in with teachers as needed. So that was a big part of it, just because that had been this like long time like fantasy that we'd always joked about. Um, the other part of this is my thesis, which a big part of that was about how schools respond to uncertainty and complexity um, and how our systems might need to change in order to respond to the complexity and volatility of um, our lives today so that all of a sudden became really relevant <laughs> more so than i had ever expected it to so um it's been really interesting for me following the developments in terms of education there in that space as well um how that compares to what some of the thinking was like that i did when i was going through my thesis in particular something that i think is really exciting is how this has brought a lot of inequity to the surface um, and has demanded that we address some of that equity so particularly i'm thinking around things like um senior students who still don't get to bring devices to school um, who still um aren't connected at home that's a massive inequity not just because they don't have it but because in a world where everything is digital almost now um more so now than ever before. Um, it's really important that we find ways to get everyone on board with in our digital spaces because that digital divide um, has implications further down the line for those students who haven't had the experience with this, with operating in this space. So that's the other thing that I was quite excited about is that it kind of drew some of the stuff right up to the um, there's an analogy there, but I can't remember it in which language it works or not, sorry. Um, but the idea that some of these things that we really should have addressed in the past, things around being flexible, things about getting everyone connected, it's really brought some of that to the surface um, and also kind of gave us a bit of a nudge and be like, hey, time to upscale now. <laughs> if you weren't quite ready for it, it's time now. So. Um, I think there definitely are silver linings. I, I say that because I live in New Zealand, though, where we've been really lucky um, to have a government that has made some really strong, compassionate decisions. Um, so I don't know if I would say that for everywhere, but I feel confident saying that there are definitely some silver linings for some of our students in this and some of our teachers. Cool. And, you know, I don't want you to underestimate, too, the impact that you had on me personally, because I, I was, um, you know, sort of not frantic, but, you know, we have been working pretty, all of us have been working pretty hard to try and bring together for stuff for our staff as we moved into a bit of an unknown. And just that simple slide 
we've got this. And then your your comments later down the corridor about, um, you know, the excitement that you were feeling about the opportunities, you know, did help calm and settle me. So I thank you for that. Um, oh. I'm, now, I'm now interested in, the, in what you've been working on over the last couple of weeks, which in theory has been um, school holiday time. Um, but you've been pretty active um, and, and pretty generous. Um, the, fir- the first thing I noticed was um, you, you launching these five-minute PLD um, video clips, which uh, are you know, really high quality. Just why, why are you doing that? And, um, and you know, yeah, well, yeah, why are you doing that? A um, couple of things. So first off, when all of this kind of unfolded, I was really interested in how other teachers were experiencing this massive disruption to our day-to-day teaching lives Um, and as far as I'm aware I don't know of anything like this that has happened in New Zealand's history quite to this extent ever before Um, or even the world none of us alive really remember (laughs) any disruption to the scale so I was really interested in how other people were feeling in this situation because I was aware I was actually feeling quite chill about the whole situation in terms of the education aspect of it all. Um, So I put together a big survey in the New Zealand lockdown teacher response survey, some fancy lots of words names that I gave it, and we got a really good response. I think we've ended up with about 300 responses. Um, And from that, I could see that um, there were a lot of different concerns coming through various teacher groups so I shared the survey through lots of Facebook teaching groups and through Twitter I emailed a few people to share it around that kind of thing so it represents a really broad set of people like across all the deciles across every region and so it was quite a nice bird's eye overview and from that I I identified that actually some of the big things that people were really concerned about um I knew a little bit that I could help them with, I could do something about it. Um, and so it just, it feels like we're all in this together. Um, so I figured I could help, I could help some people. It seemed like the thing to do, if you can help ease this huge transition and this enormous, um, I mean, for a lot of people, this does feel really big. And if I can ease it for them somehow, I can't imagine not doing it really. Mm, it's really cool. I'll I'll put the um, a link of some sort to the um, place people can subscribe to get to them. At, um, you know, with this video clip, um, because I found that I found them really useful, um, and I know other people will. Um, just another thing too is I think it was yesterday or the day before appeared on my feed um, a whole order um, activity grid sheet that you've pulled together for. Um, you're, you're going to take your hub kids through um, and you know that's people have responded really positively to that as well it's another example of your your generosity um, you should talk a little bit about that yeah what sure um, again it's kind of one of those we're all in this together things I find it useful someone else might um, part of that also is making sure that you share things in such a way that you don't overwhelm people with it So lots of people have felt quite overwhelmed with the sheer flood of um, emails of people saying, oh, you can have this service free for a month and try this for a month. And yeah, so um, part of it was just trying to manage that. So Twitter, I find, is a nice place to share it because people know that you don't have to read everything. You just scroll through until something takes your fancy. Um, And then for some reason, that one took a lot of people's fancy. You never know with the things that you share sometimes. so all it is, like you said, it's like a little grid sheet with um, different aspects of Hora, um of your well-being and how you might take some kind of a positive step and almost like an investment in that well-being aspect. Um, and some of that came from the um, some inspiration from Sally Hart's latest blog post. Mm. Um, but also a few days ago, Anne Milne put up a thing about how we need to be really careful to ensure that our digital spaces are inclusive as well. Um, so that added the whole extra column in there about cultural well-being. Um, as I worked through some of her recent blog posts for a couple of ideas. Um, so yeah, and then it looked pretty. So I thought, yeah, might be useful for someone. 
Cool. I mean, all, all the all going on is about we've got to put well-being, we've got to put whole water right at the centre of everything we do, and and it's really easy for people to say that. Um, and what, what I like is that there's a really cool tool that people can use to actually put well-being at the centre because uh, quite rightly that's what we're going to have to do at least for the first stage of this um, transition into different type of learning. I, I do like, um, I was watching Claire on one of the um, previous broadcasts, I'm not sure who she was talking to at the time, but she made the point that um, at some point though we have to move through to progressing learning and that perhaps the best way to do that will be to design learning in a way that encompasses well-being um, so it's a, um, something for us to consider exploring as well. So yeah. those are those are a couple of things you've you've been involved in. And what have there been anything else you've been focusing on um, <laughs> leading up to this Wednesday? A lot of circus. <laughs> yeah. So I, with all this extra time I've suddenly got, um, I've just been trying very hard to do my flexibility program because I want to be able to do the splits by Christmas. Excellent. So, <laughs> Excellent. Um, and of course, lot doing some planning for my actual classes as well. So, um, but that's fairly regular. So it's um, marking feedback by Google Classroom, which is nothing really different. Cool. Um, so, when, at some point, we're going to end up going back to school, um, to that physical physical place, that school. Um, what are you thinking about that and, 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 and what, what opportunities might be emerging for us as a result of this particular experience? I think something to keep in mind for, for everyone, really. Um, a few days ago, um, our Prime Minister mentioned the idea is you need to prepare for going back at every level of that alert level. Um, I think it's important that people realise that this isn't a short-term thing. Um, as long as this virus is out there, and as soon as our borders open again, we'll go through groups of infections and things again. So this needs to be addressed at a world scale before we'll actually see any kind of new back to normal life in a, a sense. In essence, so um, I think what we need to think about in terms of going back is not how we go back to the normal. We need to think about how do we run our schools in such a way that we can respond to complexity and volatility. Because for years and years now, various academics, various experts have said our world is becoming increasingly volatile. We have to prepare students so that they can cope with uncertainty. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know that schools have been particularly good at doing that. Um, I think probably my go-to example for that is if you think about any maths class, I give you a whole set of problems and for every single one of those, there's a solution. So we automatically breed in this assumption that everything has an answer when actually everything doesn't have an answer. So I think the key message I would tell anyone, whether it's in school or elsewhere, is that we need to think about how we are preparing ourselves and our systems to respond to uncertainty and volatility. Because the more prepared we are to cope with that, the less of a disruption big things like this will be. Cool. Um, I'm thinking about how my thinking has changed over time as well. Um, you know, when we began the Southern Four Point Secondary School journey, um, you know, I was really interested in this concept of blended learning and in my mindset that blended learning meant that kids would come to our school for the five days of the week and they'd do their learning, some of it with digital tools, um, being online and some of it obviously with um, direct teacher instruction and collaboration with their, their students all the time being on that same site. And one of the uh, broadening my thinking that's come about is you know actually blended learning actually means all of that plus off and on site um, yeah. and you know we see in our own school the huge motivation that those 40 or 50 kids who go off on internships every Wednesday um, they're, they're off site um, they're doing some of their most powerful most valuable learning um, and, and creating pathways for themselves 
So you know, for me, it, it's just it's made that that difference to my thinking. What what could what could school look like um, in a true blended fashion? Um, any thoughts on that? I remember marking an assessment last year for one of the students in my senior bio class who wanted to look at polar bears. Um, and I kind of just had faith in the student. They managed themselves well, so I said go for it, even though it was a little bit outside of what I'd normally recommend for the assessment. Um, and then when I marked his assessment, turns out he'd used the internet to get in touch with a research scientist based in the Arctic who works with polar bear research there and had been discussing his research project with her backwards and forwards over the past few weeks. Um, blended learning for me, that's the stuff. Um, it's because blended learning can take us into all new kinds of possibilities. This isn't just a case of making your worksheet digital. Um, that's like the real basic level, but really this has, um, opportunities for us to really redefine education to be far more relevant um, than what it has potentially been for many students over the few generations now. It's hard to talk to any generation without finding someone who's like, oh, I hate it school or school didn't work for me. In fact, I was reading this morning that apparently Mike Hosking didn't finish school. So I really hope he shuts up about his science ideas soon. <laughs> I was watching um, one of the Disrupt Dead TV uh, broadcasts with Karen Spencer from Wellington, and she made a really neat comment about uh, schools, that the connections that, that occur when people physically come into a school is, is the glue that helps create what a school is. And I, I think what she was, um, you know, forewarning against was that we totally up everything and, and believe that we can learn um, off-site. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of um, learners being on and off-site um, as they make their way through their learning, um, you know, is something I'm really keen with, with people like yourself and, and those neat minds and our staff to, to explore explore further. Because, you know, you, you, can't, you can't do without that physical being together and and um, connecting and collaborating in the same space because I know just in these two and a half short weeks that's the thing that I've missed the most um, despite the ability to connect and collaborate in ways that we're doing now it's, it's bringing that same bit of air together um, makes a difference. One of the biggest highlights of my education career um, is that first EdChat NZ conference that we had at Hobsonville Point that this group of people organized who'd never met each other in real life. It was all online. Um, and the morning of that conference, the, watching Philippa and Melmore um, embrace me, like, it's so nice to meet you when it's this, they've accomplished this incredible thing of bringing together hundreds of teachers so many different parts of the education sector, students, everything, it, it was incredible. Yet it was that morning that they got to meet for the first time. And, and those friendships, they continue. So whether it starts in the online space or not, it starts in the physical world. These two things, the online and the offline, that we, they empower each other. Um, and it, I think we would be really wise to plan for how we could leverage those two together. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to you being part of a team that really want to explore that uh, going forward. It, Me it'd too. It would be really cool. Hey, Danielle, those are the questions that I had. But I was just thinking, to finish off, you know, Term 2 kicks off on Wednesday. Um, we've got a plan. Um, and I imagine... All other schools have got a plan. Um, what what would be your advice to people um, as they prepare for that um, opening of the new term on Wednesday? What are the main things to, to focus on? I think my number one piece of advice is it's going to go wrong. And not as you expect, and that's totally okay. Um, the thing about complexity and chaos and volatility and all of this stuff is as long as we don't stay where we are, but we keep going, actually, what if we change this? Let's test this bit. 
let's adjust here. Um, as long as we're responsive, there's that hops and ball habit again. Um, we will improve and we'll get better at this. Um, but it's unrealistic of us to expect that everything is going to be perfect on day one. We've got to give ourselves a break, take it easy, and fail smarter and fail forward kind of thing. Cool. Yeah. I think you're dead right. We've got this. Um, we've got a plan, but the plan is not going to work all the time and we'll need to keep changing it. Um, yeah. That, and I think teachers are excellent at making the best of a situation. Yep. That, that's one thing I can I feel completely confident saying about teachers. Doesn't matter if they don't have resources, doesn't matter if there's no money, they find a way to make things work for their students. So I, I feel pretty confident that we've got this. Cool. Kia ora, Danielle. It's it's great. You, you've, you've lifted my level of confidence just um, by having this conversation and I'm sure other people will get infected um, by your your optimism. And your nice choice of words there, Maury. <laughs> get <Is> infected. <laughs> Yeah, true. Um, cool. So um, that's this episode. Um, and I'll um, put in some links that I think are appropriate um, to go with it. And um, I hope the rest, everybody out there um, feels rested and confident and optimistic, ready, ready for Wednesday. So um, I'm going to figure out how to turn this thing off. <laughs>